So in this final week, uh, final lecture for week three, I'd like to think about other things that we've learned about epigenetic control from the fly. So in last lecture, we thought about fly dosage compensation, and actually this alerted us to the idea that maybe there could be upregulation of that active X chromosome in mammals. But we've actually learned a huge amount of epi about epigenetic control from studies that have been done in the fly. And much of this has come from studies of position effect variegation, which I'll explain in the coming slides, and screens, mutagenesis screens that have been done in the fly to find modifiers of position effect variegation. And really, this is a way to find new epigenetic regulators. So what's position effect variegation? Well, by position effect, what we mean is that the position of the gene relative to heterochromatin can help influence its expression. So if a gene is neighboring heterochromatin, it's more likely to be silenced than if a, if a gene is distal to heterochromatin. I've explained variegation before, but let me just recap on it. A variegate, variegated expression, like you might see in variegated ivy or in variegated um, coat colors in dogs, like beagles, for example, we know that you get the mosaic expression of a gene in cells of the same tissue. So this means that a particular gene can either be on and active and expressed or silent, but within the very same cell type. So say, for example, in the leaf of variegated ivy, you can have the green pigment being, pigment being expressed and on in some cells and those parts of the leaf are green, or in other parts of the leaf that green is turned off and you have white sections of the leaf. So putting the two together then, position effect variegation is saying that some genes when located, or genes when located near the heterochromatin, can display variegation. So they can be sometimes on and sometimes off, and this is determined by the fact that they are nearby to heterochromatin. So in the fly, position effect variegation um, is observed in the eye color phenotypes. And this is when position effect variegation was first described. So if you think about a gene called the white gene, What's confusing is the white gene actually codes for red pigment. And this is because historically genes were named not by their function, but by um, the phenotype that resulted when the gene was mutated. So if you have a mutation in the white gene, it means you can't produce red pigment and you have a white eye, and hence why it's called the white gene. We know that in the DNA, the white gene is normally located in euchromatin, so this orange euchromatin distal to the centromere and distal to the heterochromatin that surrounds the centromere, this pericentromeric heterochromatin. And in this case, the white gene is always active, and therefore you have a completely red eye in the fly. But sometimes what happens is that this white gene is translocated due to a DNA rearrangement, and it's then located close to the heterochromatin, which is found at the centromere. When the white gene is translocated in this way, the heterochromatin found at the centromere can spread out to sometimes um, encapsulate and, and cover that white gene. So if the heterochromatin spreads through the white gene, it's then silenced, it's turned off, and you have white pigment being um, produced rather than red pigment. And so in this case, what we know is that this spreading is not completely efficient. It doesn't happen in every cell in the same way. And so what ends up happening in the fly eye is a variegated expression. And so my naive drawing of this here is that you have little dots of red within an otherwise white eye. And so this is the variegated eye phenotype, which is, position, uh, is the, um, the result of position effect variegation in the fly. Interestingly, this spreading of heterochromatin um, is not uh, restricted to occurring in the fly. We now know that it occurs in essentially all organisms and is a common feature of heterochromatin. We also know that it's not restricted to spreading from the pericentromeric heterochromatin, this heterochromatin near the centromere, but can also occur from other regions of heterochromatin, such as the telomere or um, repetitive elements that, were, that are densely heterochromatinized. And if you think back to what I said about X inactivation, we know that the heterochromatin there also spreads throughout the whole X chromosome. So if left unchecked, you can imagine that heterochromatin spreading would mean that the whole genome would end up being densely packaged down and heterochromatinized, and, and clearly that's not what happens. And so heterochromatin spreading is limited by DNA elements known as boundary elements, and these boundary elements insulate the surrounding region um, from this spreading. So now to look at um, position effect variegation and how they've used position effect variegation, or PEV, to find genes involved in epigenetic control. 
So down the bottom here, we've got three pictures of fly eyes. These are the real eyes now, rather than my naive drawings. And you can see this one has a lot of white and only a little bit of red. And then we've got two here that have much more red in them. And so this variable phenotype can occur. In this case, it's because there have been mutations that have occurred in other genes that are important in this position effect variegation. So in epigenetic modifiers, in fact, so what Drosophila genetics, geneticists did um, 30 years ago, they started about 20 or 30 years ago, was they took this mosaic eye pigment phenotype, this position effect variegation, and they knew that this seemed to be an epigenetic effect. They couldn't, they, it seemed to be that this, this phenotype could be determined by the expression of the gene and it was epigenetic. So what they did was they performed a mutagenesis screen. I won't go through exactly the details of what a mutagenesis screen is, but suffice to say they take a parental fly with a given level of variegation and they um, expose it to mutagens and this introduces mutations spread throughout the genome. They then breed and look at the phenotype of the eye in the next generation. And so they're looking for where there have been heritable DNA mutations, just regular mutations, which alter the expression of that variegated eye phenotype, alter the position effect variegation. They then go back and find where those mutations occurred and the genes in which they occurred are likely to be important for epigenetic control. So in fact what we know is that they were able to identify, um, they identified hundreds of different strains and these worked out to have mutations in, in close to 200 different genes. And they classified these, each of these strains as being suppressors of variegation. And a suppressor of variegation really means that you get less variegation and so the eye is more red like what's shown in these two images here. There is more red in each of these two eyes compared with um, the original eye. So these are suppressors of variegation and so you would expect because you get more activation that the mutations occurred in a repressor protein. And secondly they, they identified enhancers of variegations or EVARs and in these cases they increase the variegation so they result in more white in the eye and so that you expect to have mutated an activator protein. So when they've mapped each of these genes, they then identified new genes involved in epigenetic control. We now know these genes are some of the, um, the very uh, most fundamental epigenetic regulators, some of which I've mentioned to you. So three examples of the SUVARs are an H3K9 methyltransferases, histone deacetylases, and a chromobox protein known as HP1, which itself binds to methylated H3K9. But indeed, many of the proteins that we know are important in epigenetic control in mammals were first discovered in these PEV screens in fly and then we looked for a similar gene in mammals. So really much of what we know about epigenetic control in mammals comes from these fundamental studies which were performed in the fly. But people and mice or other mammals really aren't a fly. So we're not, well, there are many things that we do differently to flies and X inactivation is just one example of that. And so What's been happening more recently is, uh, over the last 10 years or so, are screens, similar sorts of screens in mice. So in this model system, we would hope we could find things about mammalian epigenetic control. In this case, these screens also used a variegated um, expression. In this case, it's a transgene, a GFP transgene. This green fluorescent protein transgene is directed to express in red blood cells. So here is shown a smear of red blood cells and you can see that not all of those red blood cells express the green fluorescent protein. So in the same way as was performed in the fly, this, uh, these animals were exposed to mutagen and then they were bred and, it was, and this variegated phenotype in the red blood cells, the expression of GFP was tested in the offspring and they then looked for those that had a different expression. For example, here you can see a greatly increased proportion of cells that red blood cells that express GFP and then the mutations were mapped to find out which genes were they in so that we could find new epigenetic modifiers. Now, as you'd expect, many of the um, homologs of the fly proteins important in epigenetic control were found, and that's reassuring because it meant that the screen was working in the same sort of way. But importantly, this screen has also identified novel proteins, and in particular, it identified SMOOCHD1, which I mentioned earlier. And these novel proteins are unique to higher organisms and are in particular involved in epigenetic processes which only happen in higher organisms. And in particular, as you remember, I mentioned SMOOCHD1 is important in X inactivation. And so through these screening approaches, using variegated expression, 
we can find novel genes that are important in epigenetic control and therefore deepen our understanding of how this um, exciting process occurs. So next week we're going to think about um, epigenetic reprogramming that I have briefly touched on because we get the clearing of exon activation. We're going to go into more detail about epigenetic reprogramming and also genomic imprinting. But I hope, you, hope you've enjoyed dosage compensation for this week. <laughs>